All right, now, what a great chapter of the Bible, great book of the Bible, the book of Esther. I'm actually not going to be preaching too much. There's so many things you could probably come to your mind of what you can preach on through the book of Esther, especially this passage. There's a lot going on there. But what we see happening, of course, is this story of, um, um, what's his name? Um, Haman. Yeah, Mordecai, but Haman, Haman had, had made this decree because he hated Mordecai and he hated that he wouldn't bow down for him. And he, he, he ultimately he ended up hating the, the religion of the Jews. He hated those that worshiped the Lord because they weren't bowing down and worshiping him. He was full of pride. And so he, he got it in his mind because Mordecai was a good guy. Mordecai was a guy that, that you know, uh, stood at the gates and he was someone who was, was good and, and, you know, helped out the king. He, he reported some people that were conspiring against the king. And, you know, he'd done a lot of good things. And it was kind of hard for Haman to really do anything against him because he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was trying to find occasion against him, wasn't able to do it. So he decided, well, let's just pass this law to just exterminate, wipe out all the Jews. And that's a pretty heavy commandment. And the king... As he wears, he just gave him, he's like, okay, yeah, just do whatever you want. You know, he gave him the key, the, the ring to just be able to sign off, whatever you want to do. And, um, and that's what, what happened here is that that proclamation then was sent out into all the kingdom that, hey, on this day, at this time, we're going to kill the Jews and you're going to get a bounty or payment if you go and, and attack these people, right? So Mordecai hears about this and it grieves him. And what he ends up doing is humbling himself by putting on sackcloth and ashes. And sackcloth is basically, it's just kind of like a basic covering that's not fancy at all. It's not like normal clothing. It's something that you would just put on to really humble yourself. It might be something that someone who's extremely poor, who has no money, would like put on to cover themselves. And it's, it's something that was put on to just show that you're extremely upset, you're grieving, you're mourning. You know, something bad has really happened and he decides to fast and he's weeping and wailing. And, you know, all those many people, the Jews, now they're upset when they hear this news. And he tells Esther, hey, you know, you need to go in and talk to the king about this because you're the king's wife. And she says, well, you know, everybody knows the law of the land is that no one can just go in and talk to the king. Like you have to be summoned. You have to be beckoned to go and talk to him. And if you just decide to go in there, you know, the, the result is a death penalty. So I'm going to be put to death if I just go in and just decide to talk to the king, unless he holds out his scepter when I go and do it. So you're saying it's a pretty risky thing for me just to, to go on in there. And he's like, hey, you know, don't think that you're going to be safe and that you'll be safe just because you're in the king's house. If you allow this to happen, if you don't go in and try to talk to the king, this is going to happen and you're going to get killed too anyways. So you might as well just go and, and try to talk to him. And she says, okay, you know, here's what I want you to do. And she commands that the people would fast for her for three days and three nights. Now, the reason why I'm kind of going into all this detail when we read this chapter, I'm going to be preaching on fasting, on proclaiming a fast and just going kind of through some of the ins and outs of why do people fast, what is fasting and, and do we do it today? Is this something we should observe? So we're going to go into all of this stuff this afternoon. So what is a fast? First of all, just what is a fast? Real, real simple and basic. Fasting in general, you're going to be referring to not eating or not eating and not drinking. Basically, you're withholding something from yourself. And we'll get into a lot more of just biblical fasting. But fasting is something that isn't just done like in Scripture or in the Bible. You've probably fasted before. If anyone's ever had to have a surgery, you've had to fast before having a surgery because the doctors don't want you having food or anything in your stomach that could come out. They end up giving you drugs and things that you could vomit up and whatever, right? They, they want you to have a clear stomach. Your body's kind of clean of not having as, you know, as much of that food or anything in you. So you fast for that. So those other reasons to fast. You could have certain health reasons you want to fast, but we're going to be covering just biblical reasons for fasting. And 
If you think of, you know, even breakfast, right? We say the word breakfast. What does breakfast mean? It means you're breaking your fast because for an extended period of time, you haven't eaten. For however long you've been sleeping, plus however long it's been since your last meal, now you're, you've been fasting, you haven't been eating, so now you're going to break your fast, right? That's where the word comes from. It's an easy way to remember what fasting is. Oh yeah, breakfast, we'll break the fast we're, because we're eating. Um, so in the Bible, why do people fast? Fasting is withholding, and sometimes it's food, sometimes it's food and water, you know, and oftentimes... It's not just food and water. It's many other things. It's anything that would be pleasurable or desirable or just, th you know, good things. Anything that's going to make you, you know, you're kind of, you, what you end up doing is you're afflicting yourself. And we'll get to the verses and I'll show you what the Bible talks about with fasting in a minute. But what we see here, this is a great example in Esther of why people are going to fast. It's not something that you just normally do all the time, at least for what we see in Scripture. Now, we have the one example of someone says, well, you know, the, the, remember the proud guy that's like, I oh, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this guy. And he's saying, you know, I tithe of everything I have. I fast twice in the week. You know, and he's just lifting himself up with, with all this, this pompous attitude. But what we find in, the, in Scripture is actually, you know, People fast, and you can fast as often as you want, really. And God gives a lot of flexibility with fasting, which is, which is also kind of good. I mean, there's, you, you, you can do one day, two days, three days, seven days, or in extreme case, 40 days. We have examples of Jesus Christ and Moses fasting for 40 days. Now, when it came to Jesus, it says that when he was brought into the wilderness, he was tempted of the devil. He fasted for those 40 days, but it said that he was in hunger. He was hungry after that fast, which makes sense, right? You're not eating for 40 days, but he was probably, we could, we could deduce he was probably drinking because if you withhold drinking fluids and food from yourself, your body is going to need and crave liquid more than it's going to crave that food. You're going to, your body needs that liquid more than it needs the food for sustenance. You could go a lot longer without eating than you can without drinking. So um, it, it's, it's most likely that Jesus was consuming some type of fluid, some liquid water, whatever, while he was fasting, just because of the fact that he was hungry afterwards and it didn't say he was thirsty afterwards. Now, Moses was an example of someone who didn't eat or drink for those 40 days and 40 nights, but I think that was miraculous that God sustained him through that time. So I'm not recommending a fast of 40 days and 40 nights of not eating or drinking. I would say you probably ought to drink for your health, you know, just, just to get through it. And when, when we look at the purposes for fasting, you'll understand too. It's not like, nope, it has to be no eating and drinking because you're going to find all different variations through the Bible and the purpose of the fast is more important than all of the details of the fast. However, when you do proclaim a fast, it's kind of like performing a vow before God. You're telling God in advance, hey, I'm going to fast. This is what I'm doing. So you shouldn't go and just break that fast when you, that you've already started, right? If you, if you decide to do something, if you say, I'm going to fast for three days and three nights and I'm not going to eat or drink, then you need to hold to that for it to even be meaningful at all. Like, this is what we're going to do. And um, that was the case here with, with Esther. She's asking them not to eat or drink for three days and three nights, and it's bringing affliction. So when Mordecai got the news in verse number one, it says he rent his clothes. He, he, he literally like tore his clothing, put on sackcloth with ashes. And all of that, what that's doing is just humbling yourself, making yourself low. Because if you want to be heard of God, and we're going to see this in, in many of the examples, the purpose of fasting is to get through to God. It's because something has happened that's extremely grievous. Something is really just, I mean, you know, we pray to God for many things. We should be praying daily. We should have all these things. We're asking God for our daily bread. We're asking God to help us and protect us and take care of us and, and everything we deal with on a regular basis. But sometimes really serious events happen in our life 
And we'll see many of these examples in Scripture. And that's when it's like, okay, we're stopping everything. I'm humbling myself. I'm putting on sackcloth, ashes. I am really going to make myself low because I really want to get a hold of God. And just, God, I really want you to hear me. This is really serious. And you're kind of expressing how serious this matter is to you. And you're, and you're humbling yourself. You're bringing yourself low before God for him to hear you. Because we know that God doesn't hear the proud but he hears the humble in spirit. So Mordecai rents his clothes, puts on sackcloth and ashes. And then verse three, it says, in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning. People are really upset about this. They're grieving. Great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing. So people, because of this, now they're starting to fast. And then, of course, in verse 16, this is when uh, Esther's asking for them to fast for her, for God to strengthen her, for her to be able to go in and talk and, and not lose her life for going in and, and trying to request of the king to, to change this decree. So she says, fast for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. Now, flip over, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter number nine. I'm just going to cover this real quick because we're going to see a lot of Old Testament examples of people who have fasted and, and some of the, the reasons why they fast and just go in a little bit deeper on, on um, the purpose of it and everything. But is it for New Testament believers? Well, this question came up to Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 9. Not phrased in this exact way, of course. Not, they didn't ask, is this for New Testament believers? <laughs> but they're asking about the disciples of Jesus Christ. Just say, hey, and look at verse number 14, Matthew 9. The Bible says, then came to him the disciples of John. So this is all John the Baptist, right? People who are following John and following his ministry. Saved people, good people, right? They are following John. It says, they, saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast oft? So they're saying, you know what? We're fasting a lot. And even the Pharisees, like, they, they fast a lot. He says, but thy disciples fast not. He said, we've noticed this. Right? We're, we're, we're going through these fasts and you know, the Pharisees are fasting, but your disciples aren't fasting. Why is that? And in verse number 15, Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber mourn? So now we see again a connection with fasting and mourning. Right? We saw the mourning with Esther. We saw there, there's something that's, that's grievous, something that's making you real sad and upset. But he says, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? He says, is there any reason to be mourning and, and sorrowful and sad when the bridegroom's right there with you? I mean, that, that's a time to not be mourning. That's a time to be, to be happy and, and, you know, things are going well. So it's not a time for fasting. It's a time for rejoicing, right? He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then shall they fast. And he's referring to his disciples. Then they're going to fast. When the bridegroom's taken away. Has, has the bridegroom been taken away? Yeah, a long time ago. Right? Jesus is taken from this earth physically when he was crucified on the cross. And from that point, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ especially, his disciples started to fast then. Now, again, I don't think this is something that was just done every day. But when there's a time for mourning, when there is a time of serious distress and troubles and problems, whatever it may be, then I'm going to fast. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to cover myself in sackcloth and ashes and just, and just call out to God and beg God to hear me and to help me where we're at. Because we need his help tremendously more now than ever. It's just kind of that mindset when you decide to proclaim a fast. So absolutely, there's nothing different in the New Testament when it comes to fasting. So everything we look at in the Old Testament is all going to apply going forward because Jesus himself even said, hey, yeah, they're not fasting right now. You don't see them actually doing that because I'm with them, right? And in the millennium, there's not going to be really a need to, to be fasting when Jesus Christ is right there with us and he's ruling and reigning. Things are going to be going well. There's no reason to, to perform a fast at that time. But right now, the bridegroom's not literally physically with us here. So yeah, it's, it's a time that there are going to be times when it's appropriate to fast. So some of the biblical attributes that we see of revolving fasting, I've already kind of gone this. The number one thing is people trying to seek God. That's the purpose. You're trying to get God's attention. You're trying to get through and pray. So you're going to see fasting and praying go hand in hand. 
I mean, there's, there's no reason for people to be fasting unless they're actually praying to God. You're going to see that in just, I mean, I think every single instance in Scripture is that the fast goes hand in hand with praying. Uh, and the fast, one of the things it does is it afflicts your soul. You're bringing affliction upon yourself. You're already dealing with something that's going to cause you affliction. And now you're bringing, you're kind of adding more affliction to your soul by not allowing yourself to eat. Because let's face it, it's not comfortable to not eat, right? I mean, we eat, and, and especially here, we're, you know, we're very comfortable being blessed with so much here, having food in abundance. Nobody in this church, nobody is struggling to eat on a daily basis. I could say that with certainty. I know everybody here. I know, you know, I don't know everyone's individual specific you know, how much money you have, but I know that nobody is struggling to just eat a, a meal on a daily basis. We don't have that problem. And thank God, that's great. It's a great blessing to have. But we're so accustomed now being able to eat. Sometimes, you know, you just go an extra couple hours and you're like, oh man, is, I'm hungry. I want to eat. I want to, you know. We don't get used to the idea, the concept of, of going for extended periods of time without having a meal. But even the little bit of time that you go without it, you're already starting to feel a little bit afflicted. But when you actually fast, it's bringing on so much more affliction because you're gonna, your, your body is going to continually tell you, no, I need to eat. You need to do this. Your flesh is going to keep telling you you need to do this. So you're bringing this affliction on yourself. And then the other thing you're doing, one of the other biblical attributes of fasting is the humility aspect of it. And, and just bringing yourself low and, and not being proud, not lifted up, but recognizing I need help, I need God, and doing whatever you can to just make sure that you are humble and low in the sight of the Lord. And um, so these things come along. And, and as we read through some of these examples, um, turn, if you would, to Ezra chapter number 8. I'm not going to have you turn to every single example, but I'm going to read through some of these and, and just kind of pay attention to all these various attributes or details that go along with these examples. I'm going to read for you from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And this is uh, a story with Jehoshaphat. Basically, there is, you know, some foreign armies come to invade them. And it's like, what are we going to do? You know, we're, we're outnumbered. They've got this great, this great army. And, uh, and we're not going to be able to do this. Lord, we need your help. Right? So here's an instance, as with all these we're going to see, there's always a reason why they're proclaiming a fast. And they always end up humbling themselves, and they're always going to be afflicting themselves by setting the fast. So I'm going to read, second, you're turning to Ezra chapter 8. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 2 says, Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria, and behold, they be in Hazazan Tamar, which is Engedi. And Jehoshaphat feared. So this great multitude comes, and now he's afraid because wow, there's all these people coming out to attack us, and set himself to seek the Lord. So, and how does he do it? It says, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So he said, wow, I'm having this great persecution. I'm having this great army come against me. I need to seek God. And that's the right response, by the way. If you have some serious affliction, some serious persecution, something coming down on you, you better start setting your heart to seek the Lord. Now, ideally, your heart would already be set towards the Lord, right? But sometimes these things come our way. We, we receive affliction. Sometimes they come our way in order for us to get back to setting our heart to seeking the Lord. But this is a good time either way to, to make sure your heart's right and that you are setting yourself, you, you can proclaim a fast, right? He proclaimed as a king, he's able to say, hey, we're all fasting over this. This is a big deal. And that makes sense too. I mean, the more people you can have praying and fasting, right? You want to have as many people as possible praying to God and asking for help. That's why we have our prayer list. Now, I try to, to keep our prayer list down to, you know, things that, you know, we all have our own issues, right? On a daily basis that we all ought to be praying for. But the things I add here are things that, bigger issues, some bigger problems. And the more people we have focused on praying for these people, you know, it's going to be a lot better getting through and, um, and having God hear us. The Bible says that the, uh, the fervent prayer of a, of a righteous man availeth much. 
So it's good to have people who are righteous people praying for you in your, in your times of trouble because it, it's actually going to do a lot of good. Uh, Ezra chapter 8, let's look at verse number 21. The Bible says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves. See, the purpose of the fast is saying, we're going to afflict ourselves by, by proclaiming this fast before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we had spoken unto the king saying the hand of our God is upon us, upon all them, excuse me, upon all of them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this and he was entreated of us. This story is where Ezra is saying, hey, they're, they're, the children of Israel are being allowed to go back to Jerusalem from captivity, from Babylon. They're, they're allowed to go back. They're going to start rebuilding Jerusalem, start rebuilding the temple. And Ezra's saying, you know what? Because the, the king is trying to do everything he can to help them out. Well, I could give you chariots, I give you horses. You know, and he's saying, nope, God's our defense. God will keep us safe. We're relying on the Lord. And he stepped out in faith, just saying, God will take us through. And the reason why he's concerned is because the travel from where they're at in captivity back to Jerusalem, there's, there's a significant distance involved there. And what the king had done, he's giving them back all of these, you know, silver and gold and these instruments to do service in the temple. So they're carrying a lot of valuables going back with them. So, of course, they're worried about robbers. People are going to attack them and, and just steal their stuff, right? There's, there's a significant amount of danger and risk involved with making this trip. That normally, just like you see even today, you know, banks transfer money back and forth. They're using armored vehicles. They're using you know, armed men, armed guards, and, and they're, they're putting a level of protection on their assets. But what Ezra is saying is say, you know what? We don't need your physical arm of flesh to protect us. We don't need your chariots because God's able to protect us from everything. And because he did that, and he's saying, you know what, though, this is serious. We still want to make sure we get there safely. He proclaims a fast and saying, you know, we're going to seek God. We're going to afflict ourselves. We're going to seek the right way from God and just get on our knees and beg God to help us through, through this. You know, we've already put it out there saying we're going we're gonna to do this by faith. Lord, we need you. So they fast. They afflict themselves and say, God, we're serious about this. You know, please help us. Please be with us. And... The Bible says, so, you know, in verse 23, so we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So it worked because they did in, well, this is what we did, and he heard us. He was entreated of us. We don't have, it, it, this isn't just some exercise, uh, like some futile exercise that it doesn't matter either way. And that's another thing we need to understand about God. Some people just, just get this mindset of just, well, everything's going to happen no matter what. God's just going to make sure things just work itself out. And it, you know, it, ultimately, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what we do. It's kind of a Calvinistic approach to understanding God and the Bible. And they say, well, it's all just going to work itself out. Well, it's just God's will. Well, no. Actually, the things that you do do have impact and do sway what God will do. That we find that all throughout Scripture. That because of the actions of specific people, God either does something or doesn't do something. God wants to do great things, but he needs someone to stand up and actually, of their own will, choose to say, hey, I'm here, send me. The Bible says that you know, the Lord sought for a man right, to fill a gap and to make up the hedge, and, and he said he could find none. Therefore, because there was no one willing to do that, now he's got to bring destruction. Now he's got to bring... He, look, he's ready to save. He's willing to help. He wants to do good things. But he, someone needs to step up and do something. And the same thing, you have problems in your life. Don't just say, well, I don't need to pray because God already knows everything anyway, so he just knows I need all this stuff, so I'm not going to bother. Well, no, the Bible talks a lot about us praying, a lot about us entreating God, a lot about fasting, a lot about doing these things. This isn't just some meaningless exercise. This actually does get through to God. That's why the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer. I already quoted this verse. Effectual, fervent. Fervent means you are you know, on fire. I mean, you're, this is something that really means a lot to you. This isn't something just in passing. Oh, yeah, I forgot to pray today. Dear Lord, okay, amen. And you're just doing some real quick prayer. 
That doesn't avail much. But if you want to be effectual in your prayer, you're going to be earnestly, fervently praying for things. It means something to you. You're putting the time aside. You're getting on your knees. You're calling out to the Lord. You know, we've seen weeping and wailing, sackcloth, ashes, fasting, afflicting yourself. God wants to see that from us and then be entreated of what we need. Now, you could ignore everything I say and live your life, right, and, and do whatever you want to do. But you're not going to be getting God's ear that much. I mean, this is, this is the way things work. Whether you like it or not, this is, this is what, if you want to have, if you want to have your, your prayers answered, this is a great way of doing it. Follow the model of what we see here. Follow the scripture that's saying, I did this and God wasn't treated for us. Uh, turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm going to read a few passages from the book of Psalms for you. Psalm 35, 13 says, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. So we see when David was fasting, it's, he's humbling himself. He's humbling his soul. And my prayer returned in mine own bosom. In Psalm 69, verse number 8 the Bible says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. This is, of course, a prophecy of Jesus Christ, referring to Jesus Christ. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them." This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. We see Jesus Christ wept. He fasted. He was concerned with all this stuff. And this is the example that he left for us also. He says, yeah, it was to his reproach. You know, people made fun of him and reproached him when he did this stuff, but he still did it. And he did it for good reason. He was um, afflicting his soul with fasting. And another proof, and I have this a little bit later in my notes here, but I'll just mention it right now anyways. We know that Jesus Christ was fasting when we have the example and I'll read this for you in Matthew 17 when the disciples were trying to cast out someone who was who was possessed of devils someone was possessed is demon possessed and they say well why couldn't we pay? you know they tried to cast them out because they were given power to cast out devils right and they were being successful in many cases but there's this one case where they weren't able to do it and then the disciples asked Jesus about it. Matthew 17, 19, the Bible says, Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? So why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If, there, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting." He's saying, but you know what? This kind, this is a little bit more difficult. This one is, requires prayer and fasting. Well, Jesus was able to cast it out. Now, of course, we know Jesus is the Son of God, but if he's saying this doesn't go out but by prayer and fasting, you know what that tells me? Jesus was praying and fasting. Because he cast the devil out. That's, you know, there's some things, there's some things that just won't happen is what he's saying here, unless you're doing the praying and fasting. And if you don't ever have moments where you're praying and fasting, you probably don't have a full spiritual life. Now, I'm not saying everyone has to go out today after service and say, okay, we're fasting today, you know? That's not, that's not the point. And, and we'll get that. Hopefully, by the time we're completely done and have exhausted all the scriptures, you'll understand that. But um, this is something that we ought to be thinking about and remembering. This will help you in your prayer life. It'll help you get things answered. So let's see. I'm going back to my notes where I was. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 is where I had you go. 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is the story of David. When David was caught committing adultery and committing murder, and Bathsheba was with child as a result of his adultery. And Nathan told him, okay, well, you know what? God spared you. God showed mercy on David. But the child is going to die. Well, this is a serious 
time, obviously, in David's life. He's grieved by this. He's mourning. He's weeping. He doesn't want the child to die because of his misconduct. So David fasts for the child. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child. So again, it says, And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. So why is David fasting? Because he's seeking God. He's trying to, be, you know, to, to inquire, not inquire God, but, but to get a hold of God, basically, and, and have God hear him and answer his prayer. He's seeking the Lord. Verse 17, And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. Because he was fasting, he's not eating, he's just, you know, down. It says when he lay all night upon the earth, he's just laying on the ground. But he's trying to bring himself really low. He's brought himself down to the earth. And they're coming like, come on, David, let's go, you know, like get up, come, come have a meal. And he wouldn't do any of it because he's see, his heart is just set to seek out God and afflict himself to try to entreat for the child. Now, this doesn't change God's mind. And we understand why. I mean, God's judgment was coming on us. He already showed mercy unto David. And he just said, no, this has to be, this is the way it is. But it wasn't, um, you know, it still shows David's heart. David really did have a change of heart, you know, from, from his sin and, um, and just trying to entreat God. And that's where we always want to be. You know, sometimes we may end up bringing things upon ourselves that God's not going to change his mind on, but we don't know. And even in this story, they asked him because after the child died, he, David gets up. He cleans himself off. He eats a meal. And the people that were observing him were just like, they're scratching their heads going like, normally people get upset once the child's actually dead, right? But now you're eating a meal, which you wouldn't do before. And he's, you know, and they're just like, what? Like, this doesn't make sense to us. He says, well, hey, you know, while the child was still alive, I didn't know. Who knows? Maybe God would have spared his life. There was a reason for me to be fasting. There was a reason for me to be grieving and mourning. He says, but now, you know, the child's passed on. There's nothing more that's going to happen. You know, he, say, he says, um, I shall go to him, but he shall not return unto me. But, which, by the way, is another great passage to, to illustrate and to show and to comfort people that little children, babies, they go to heaven because they're innocent. And we have an example of that in Scripture that even if some people do wicked things, you know, people have abortion, whatever, those children end up going to heaven in their innocency. But uh, let's flip over to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to see now some things, even though there's a lot of flexibility with fasting as far as how many days you fast, if it's food, if it's drink, if it's both, if it, you know, certain things that you identify that you're going to, keep yourself from. There's a lot of flexibility, but there's also some things we want to make sure we're doing. If we're going to do it, you're going to do it right. You don't want to take some time and effort and afflict yourself just to, just to do it wrong and just not be acceptable in the eyes of the Lord, right? So in Matthew chapter 6, we have Jesus giving us some instruction on this. Verse number 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites, of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, this he's talking about the Pharisees, the hypocrites. The reason why they're fasting, they're just making it known. Oh, yeah, I fast. I'm fasting right now. Oh, man, I'm so hungry. And they're going around just telling people, I've been fasting for days. Whew, man, this is, this is tough. Uh, you know, let me tell you all about it. And getting, why, why does God not want you to do that? Because then people, you, you, what you're doing is, in what they were doing especially, was they want people to think that they're really spiritual. Oh, Wow. Look at that. Look at this man of God. They're so spiritual. They're fasting. 
Right? That's why they love the long robes, because they want people to know. That's why the Catholic priest has his collar turned around backwards, because nobody dresses like, they're like oh, well, there's a priest right there. Oh, there's a man of God. Oh, here's, we love our uppermost room. And for people, when I go outside, oh, rabbi, rabbi. Oh, master, please expound this unto me. They love that glory of man. But that's not the way that, you know, that is a, a, a wicked heart that does those things just to be seen of men. And he gives the example in the same chapter about praying. He's saying, you know, you don't need to make some big oration and everyone can see, wow, how well spoken you are and how great you can pray. And oh, wow, look, you know, to, to lift up yourself in your prayer. He's saying that's, that's the wrong reason. The whole point of prayer is to talk to God. He says you can, you, you can just go, instead of making some big public prayer, just go and pray in your closet where no one could hear you. Because the whole point is you're talking to God anyways. You're not talking for the benefit of other people to hear you. You're, you're trying to get through to God. That's why you pray to Him. And he's saying the same thing with fasting. You're fasting to afflict yourself before God, not before man. Now, there's some instances where in the midst of afflicting yourself, other men may see you. But like in David's case, when, the, when his servants were there and trying to help him out, they're like, hey, come eat a meal. He's not doing it so that they can see that he's afflicting himself to, to make himself look real godly and spiritual. That's not why he did it. They just happened to be around witnessing what was happening, but he wasn't doing it for their benefit, for their sake. You see, what comes down to is what's in your heart. That's really what matters the most, as with pretty much everything in God's eyes as well. It's just like offering a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, was a sacrifice necessary? Yes, but what God was more concerned about was their heart. God wanted to make sure that, that their heart was in it. If your heart's not right, and we'll get to that in a minute. Turn if you would to Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to see some examples here of, of people doing things for the wrong reasons. But fasting correctly, one, he says... You know, when it says anoint thine head, basically you keep your face washed, you keep yourself groomed, you, know, you look normal to everyone else, even though you're afflicting your soul and you're fasting. Right? You're not trying to draw attention to yourself through your fast. You're just trying to get through to God. Two, in 1 Corinthians 7, and you could just write this down if you want to flip at it later, look at this later. The Bible says in verse 4, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other. So this is talking about having a physical relationship with your spouse. The Bible teaches that you should be having a normal relationship and that one person shouldn't be withholding themselves from the other and that you know, you're one flesh and that you both have power over the other person's body and you should be able to, any time that anyone wants to have that relationship within marriage, you ought to be able to have that relationship. That, 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 is, that is what should be done. But, he says, the exception is, except it be with consent. So where you're withholding yourself from your partner, partner, your spouse, you got to be careful. You can't, the brainwashing, man, it works. You got to watch out for that. People using that word partner. I, I'm not going to get into that. So he says here, defraud ye not one the other. Don't withhold yourself from your part, from, man, there we go again, from your spouse, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. He said the reason why you'd actually withhold that relationship is because you're fasting and you're in prayer. You're afflicting yourself already. So you're not going to allow that, that extra pleasurable experience because you're, you're in a state of mourning and affliction. Make sense? So you're going to be that way with, with a lot of things. I mean, it wouldn't make sense to be fasting and mourning and praying to God and, and the whole time like you're going to Six Flags, right? You're not going to go do all this amusement and fun stuff and, and, and things that are going to be, you know, just fun and joyful, whatever, because the whole point is to afflict <laughs> yourselves. So what you add to, and, 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 you know, fill in the blank, right? When you, so when you're doing a fast, you want to consider these things, that you're not like w whatever it may be that's just all this fun stuff. We're, we're withholding ourselves from, from that. We're, 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 we're keeping that uh, from, from our lives in order to just focus on this one need that we have that's a serious need. 
And that's why we don't just do this all the time. I and mean, this isn't something for like the smallest of things that you want to help with, that you're just going to institute this fast and have you know, nothing to do with anything. This, these are certain times where, no, this is a big deal. Isaiah 58, look at verse number one. The Bible says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labor. So before we get even further into this, verse number one, he's telling Isaiah, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Hey, let my people know their sins. Because the state that they're in, the condition that they're in, he says in verse two, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. So they're as a nation, as, as a nation that did righteousness. So in their eyes and in their mind, they're saying, no, we're seeking the Lord. We want to know what God has for us, right? This is what they're thinking, that they're doing right. And we want to know everything that God has for us. You know, we're right with God. But it's not true. It says, and forsook not the ordinance of the Lord. So they're saying they're acting like a nation that is seeking God and, and they're not breaking any of the commandments. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. So they, they find it happy. Yeah, we're going to go seek the, God, seek the Lord. Right? There's a spiritual attitude, but they're not right. That's why verse 1, he says, hey, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their sins. Because they need to see where they're wrong. They had this puffed up attitude thinking, yeah, we're all great and fine and everything's good and we're seeking the Lord but they really weren't. And then in verse three, now they're saying, well, wait, we fasted and why didn't you see us? Like we, we did these things. We've been real spiritual. We did a fast, God, but why aren't you hearing us? Why did we, you know, wherefore, which means why, why have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge? Why are we even doing it? Like, like I thought this is what we're supposed to do. But then he says, behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. You say, first of all, when you're fasting, you're, you know, it's like you're checking off a box of fasting. Oh, I want to get through the God, to God. Okay, I'm just going to fast and withhold food for myself. And it's like their, their heart's not in it. They're still just finding pleasure. He says, and exact all your labors. Life's just going on as normal. Everything's just fine. That's not the fast that God has commanded. Look at verse 4. He says, behold, ye fast for strife and debate. Like this is the reason why you're fasting now, to, for, for fighting and for debates. And he says, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. So not only are they not fasting right, they're fasting for the wrong reasons. I'm not gonna answer you. I'm not gonna be listening to you when you're fasting for these cause and you're fasting this way. He says in verse five, is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? So he's giving them the thing that they really ought to be doing, a fast that I have chosen, right? Is he saying, is your fast a day to afflict your soul, to bow down your head as a bulrush, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? And um, he says, wilt thou call this a fast and acceptable day to the Lord? Verse number six, is not this the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke. And what he's doing here is he's, he's contrasting now the actual fast with what they should be doing. What I mean by that is, you know, the reason why they're having these problems come upon them is because they're doing the things in verse number six. Lo you know, they haven't loosed the bands of wickedness. They're, they have these heavy burdens on people. They're oppressing people and they're bringing people under bondage. And what he's saying is, why don't you start off, instead of trying to go through these steps of proclaiming a fast to, 
to, to solve your problems, why don't you just stop being wicked to people? Why don't you stop oppressing people? Because that's where your problems are coming from. This fast isn't going to help until you get your heart right, until you get this, this wicked sin out of your life. Then you go and you fast to the Lord. Right? So I, I'm not going to fast to God if I'm committing adultery, if I'm doing all this other stuff. And, and we see it didn't even work. It didn't work for David. Now he ended up getting his heart right with God, but he had already done the wrong. And what's happening with the children of Israel here is that they're saying, oh, well, we're fasting for this, right? We're, 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 we're trying to entreat you, Lord, but you're doing all this wickedness. And God's judgment's still going to come on you. He's not going to hear you because you're not recognizing the source and the root of the problem. It's not, you, you don't just, just walk through a bunch of hoops to just say, well, you're forgiven now. It's like in the Old Testament, people would give a sacrifice for their sins. And this is what I was alluding to a little while ago. Now, we know the Bible teaches very clearly that the blood of bulls and of goats can never cleanse you from your sin. The Bible teaches us very clearly that all of those, sin, all those sacrifices, they were all ultimately a picture, a representation of Jesus Christ who is to come and, and provide the ultimate forgiveness for sin. However, it was still under, it was still the law that when people would transgress, and sin, they'd bring a sin offering, they would bring these offerings to God as to, to obey God's commandments and obey his laws. That was something they were supposed to do. Now, even though it's part of the law, if someone is just willfully sinning and just saying, well, now I got to bring this, this sacrifice to the Lord because we're, you know, because this is, this is the law is what I got to do. If they just go and do that sacrifice, but their heart is not like, they're not sorry for what they did. They're just like, yeah, whatever. I just need to go and do this. And okay, yeah, fine. But, but there's, no re there's no remorse. There's no grief. That's not going to do anything in God. God doesn't, he doesn't care about the actual, just like the, the, the animal being sacrificed. Like just, just, for the, just for the sake of being sacrificed. He cares way more about your heart getting right. Now, the, the sacrifice has meaning to it. It's representing of It's symbolic. But it's not, it's not doing any good if your heart's not right. It's just, it, it's... That's why the Bible says, he says, you know, you think that God, God doesn't delight in your sacrifice as much as he delights in your obedience. And I, I'm totally mis, uh, misquoting that scripture. But... Um, the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. Obeying God's commandments, that's way better than just performing sacrifice. And it's the same way with fasting. To just live right and do good is way better than, you know, jumping through some hoops of, of just, oh, I'm performing this fast. And that's what the children of Israel were doing in Isaiah 58. They're just trying to look and appear spiritual and just check off all these different boxes, but their heart wasn't right. So if you were going to plan on fasting and seeking God, the first thing you want to do is make sure your heart is right. You know, if you have, if you have issues that's going to be, you know, coming in between you and the Lord because you just have some wicked sin, deal with that before you go try and do entreat mercy of the Lord. Because why would God be merciful to you while you're still involved in some extreme wickedness? And that's the point he's trying to get across here when, in regards to fasting in this passage. Now let's, um, real quickly, flip, if you would, to Daniel chapter 9. It's the last place I'll have you turn this afternoon, Daniel chapter 9. There are a couple other reasons, at least one other reason why you would want to fast. So um, obviously you're seeking God. You want God to uh, show mercy, help you out in a time of, of affliction. But fasting was also done, as we saw, you know, when the disciples wanted power from the Holy Ghost to cast out devils, right? To do the Lord's work was also another time for fasting. So you're not grieving, right? They're not, it's not a time of mourning, necessarily for the disciples to be able to cast out a devil. But that kind still isn't going to go out without the prayer and fasting, right? 
So while the majority of instances we see about fasting has to do with some great affliction, some mourning, things like that happening in your life, so you're going to seek God that way, another time that you would seek God would be to seek God's power from the Holy Ghost upon you to do great works for God. And we see another example in Acts 13. You're in Daniel chapter 9. But in Acts 13, chapter number, or verse number 2, the Bible says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So the disciples, they're fasting and praying for these men to, have their, to, to be ordained to go and sent out and to go do this great work of the Lord. And because it's such a big deal, it's a big task, it's a big work, they're afflicting themselves with the fast and saying, God, you know, we want all of your power to rest upon these men that are going to go out and do your work. It's a big deal. This isn't just some small task, some small you know, undertaking. It's a big job. And they're taking it seriously. And, and their prayer is more for the, the power of God to be upon that person in a similar way that they needed the power of God to cast out those devils. You know, the, the fasting and the prayer was involved with that. So it wasn't necessarily a time of sorrow. It's just a time of this is serious. This is something we really want done. So, you know, when we have events coming up, you know, I've been pu pushing to pray for, you know, the, the soul winning things, you know, the soul winning marathons, the conference, like bigger events. It's also a good idea to say, hey, well, why don't you proclaim a fast? Not just pray, proclaim a fast, fast and pray and just, hey, let's focus on this big event, this big thing coming up. Let's make this a big day, a big event, and, and really try to entreat the Lord to just have the maximum impact that we could have. Now, in the meantime, we're going to be doing soul winning. We're doing, you know, our Bible reading. We're going to live our life. We'll try to do everything that we can on a regular basis, but we're going to focus on this one thing, this one thing coming up, this one event, whatever it is, and, and that's what we're going to pray and fast for. And that would be a very biblical or very scriptural example of, of something that you would be fasting for. Daniel chapter 9, we see here, and, and we're not going to read through all of this, but on your own time, you can read through the entire chapter later. We're just going to read through the first part. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's explaining that basically as he's reading and studying the Word of God, he's, he understands that the children of Israel have been in captivity, and now that they've been there for their 70 years, that it's, it's going to be time for them to return back. So he's entreating God and confessing their sin before God because he knows all throughout the Bible, God says, you know, I'm not going to hear you until you come back to me. You know, when he says, hey, when you reject me, you go after other gods. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send people. Well, I'm going to take you out of the land. You're going to be removed from your inheritance. But if you turn your heart and seek me, then I'll be found of you. Then I'll be heard. Then I'll bring you back. Then I'll welcome you back. And Daniel knows this and he sees it and says, hey, this is the time for God to, to receive us back. You know, we've done our time. So he pours out his heart and he's just praying for himself, praying for the people, praying for everybody and humbling himself and just begging God. And you know what? I believe Daniel needed to do this. Someone needed to do this to be brought back into the land. Because they needed to get their heart right. If their heart still wasn't right with God, if they didn't humble themselves and return to God, God wouldn't have brought them back. Someone needed to do this. Daniel chapter number 9, like verse number 2. The Bible says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So basically, he's like, I understood from Jeremiah's preaching from the word of the Lord that it's going to be 70 years. And he said, I learned this by books. I studied this. And okay, well, here's where we're at now. And verse three says, and I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. He's going all out. He's humbling himself. Sackcloth, ashes, prayer, fasting. Verse four, and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. 
Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of land. And it goes on and on. And like I said, I recommend reading this whole chapter. Read all of it. Because this is a good model for you to follow, especially if, it's, if, if the reason why you're mourning and praying and fasting is because you were involved in some kind of a sin. And you're trying to get things right with God. And you're trying to beg and ask for mercy from God. And you're getting your heart right and setting your heart right with God. Read through this because you'll see some of the ways that, first of all, he even approaches speaking to the Lord. We see that in the Lord's Prayer also, you know. Um, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom. And it starts off with just addressing God extremely respectfully. And giving him honor and praise and dignity and glory because of who he is just from the very onset not just flippantly saying okay god well i got some you know no you're 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 establishing the power the might the authority of god almighty and that you are humbly meekly begging god to hear you and entreating the lord and daniel does an excellent job of expressing this to God and confessing these sins and just saying, Lord, you know, we've done all this. We've been wrong. We've been bad. We haven't done right. But Lord, now we want to do right. And, and you can read through all of that. And that is the attitude. That is the heart that you need to have when you're entreating the Lord. And that is what's going to make your fast effective. If your heart is right and your heart is in it. Now, the last thing I want to cover is just some extra benefits to fasting. If you, when you actually start fasting, there is other benefits that come along with this. Obviously, the main goal and the objective and the priority is to seek the Lord. And you're entreating God to help you with something. But in so doing, in keeping with a, a fast periodically at some points to, to seek out the Lord... One of the things that fasting will teach you to do is to gain control of your body. Being in charge of what you do, having a willpower to do certain things. You need to have willpower in order to tell your body not to eat. Because the, especially the longer that you go, your body is going to be more and more drastically trying to get you to eat something. I know there's been many times where I've fasted. I used to ride a motorcycle back in Arizona. And I remember some days where I'd be fasting and then I'm driving home from work and it's like your senses are heightened. <laughs> so people would be like grilling in the backyard or something. And whereas normally, see when you're satisfied, when your soul is satisfied and you're not hungry, don't even notice those things. But the longer you go and the more hungry your body is, you're just like, wait, is that, yeah, that's a cheeseburger. Wait, that's, oh man, that smells good. Oh man, what are they, I want to stop by right now and invite myself over for dinner. That smells good. Why? Because your body is craving that food, so it's going to be telling you more and more, hey, do this. Now, if you can control that and say, no, I'm in charge. I'm not going to eat. I know I'm thirsty. I'm not going to drink. That will strengthen you inwardly in your spirit to be able to then apply that to other things also. If you know that you can gain control over your flesh and the most basic things of food for your sustenance and not feeding your belly, you can also control yourself when it comes to other fleshly lusts and desires that you may have and say, no, I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. No, I'm not going to drink that booze. No, I'm not going to watch that porno. No, I'm not going to do whatever it is that is, uh, that is bringing you into bondage that is that fleshly desire that's causing you into sin. If you can start doing it with the food, you should be able to apply that to anything. And just say, no, I'm serious before God. And when you, and when you make the fast and say, God, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm doing. I recommend doing this from the onset. Lord, I'm going to fast, and I'm going to fast for three days, or whatever, whatever you choose. You start with one day, right? Because you don't want to start doing something and, and realize, I can't do this. Start with a day. 
Start with sunrise to sunset. No food. And build on that. And you will gain control and gain the willpower that you're going to need because when it comes to sin, we ought to just be cold turkey with everything. And you realize something's not right. You need to just be like, no, I'm not doing this. I'm plucking out that eye. I'm cutting off that hand, you know, whatever it is. I'm just, I'm, we're cutting out that cancer. I don't want to have just a little bit of, of pestilence, a little bit of cancer just residing in me and just slowly remove. No, let's just get rid of all of it. I don't want none of that in my body. We need to be that way with our sin. And fasting can help you with that. Fasting, one, fa if, if there's some particular sin in your life that's been plaguing you, that's a pretty good reason to proclaim a fast for yourself. I'm going to fast about this. And at, going through that process, you know, the, it will help you to be more dedicated to getting rid of that sin, making it as real as possible, saying, you know what, I really want to do this. Consciously, I want to get this out of my life. So I'm going to fast to God, show God I'm serious about this, ask God for help. So I could overcome this sin. So I could not be tempted. He could, he could keep me from temptation. He could, he could help me to be strengthened to overcome this. And even just going through the process of doing that fast, you're going to make it more real to yourself also that this is something I really want to do. It's not something I'm kind of half in, half out, wishy-washy. Well, I want to quit smoking, but I really like smoking. Right? Because if you, if you have that attitude towards whatever the sin is in your life, you're not going to get rid of it. It's not going to happen. And it, 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 you know, for a long time, I would think like, yeah, you know, I shouldn't drink anymore. I need to stop drinking. But when you have the excuse, well, you know, except I'll do it here. Oh, I got, it's okay here now and then. Forget it. It's, you're going to keep doing it. You need to just say, no, I'm done with this. Not happening anymore. And you've got to get serious about it. You need to be serious with your fast and be serious when you're going to, if you want to, you know, uh, get any of that sin out of your life. So hopefully that helps you. You know, there's a little bit more that could be said about fasting in general, but that's kind of the, the, the main overview of it. I know a lot of people may not have even don't know a whole lot about it because even just in our culture, it's not something that people do a lot of. But it is something that will help you spiritually overall. And um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for teaching us so many helpful points and in, 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 uh, areas of instruction where we can speak to you and you can hear us, Lord, and I pray that you would please just help us to have a good heart, a right heart within us to want to do right. And Lord, help us to evermore just continue to modify our lives and make the changes where needed that we can just be more righteous and right with you, dear Lord. And um, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.